for being here with us today. Um, we're gonna, I guess everyone has the agenda with them, but we're gonna do a quick round of intros. Um, first, we'll start out with the folks that are on the Blue Horizons Project Community Council. Um, and then I imagine we'll probably have time to do just a quick intro for the folks that are not part of that. Um, we are gonna limit public comment for till the end of the meeting. We did create at least 15 minutes of time for folks that are not on the community council to talk at that time. Uh, that was some feedback we got last time that's really helpful just to be able to kind of consolidate public comment at that, that point. So we're gonna follow that direction. Um, so I'm just gonna, what we're just gonna do is just real quick, your name and if you're with an organization or if you have a spe specific, um, industry you represent, you can speak to that. So um, we'll start with the folks that are on the community council first on my screen. So uh, Dave Erb is the first person I see. So go for it, Dave. Hey, I'm Dave Erb. I'm a retired automotive engineer. Spent most of my career teaching. The last 10 years of that was at UNC Asheville in the mechatronics program. Specialty is electric and hybrid electric vehicles. Awesome. All right, you, you're up, Phelps. <laughs> So Phelps Clark from uh, Chicago Solar. Um, yeah, I've been I've been uh, doing solar in this town for about 15 years, and uh, really excited to be a part of this group. Okay, uh, David King. Yeah, I'm uh, David King, Western Carolina. I'm the energy manager here on campus. I also do the building automation system. So that's all the controls for the HVAC. Um, that's so. Yeah, definitely commercial buildings and came from a weatherization background. So those are kind of my two passions. Glad to be here. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, all right, uh, Keith. Bamberger, um, work for the North Carolina Division of Air Quality, but I've got many years of experience in actually communicating about um, energy and strategies to reduce air pollution with all the co-benefits with carbon reductions. And I've been doing this for a while. Okay. All right, Ken Nelson. Yeah, hi, I'm Ken Nelson with Blue Delta Energy. We are a company focused on the environmental policy and the markets for the various incentive credits. We work, for example, with Santee Cooper on their landfill portfolio. We work with a number of solar and hydroelectric projects here in the state. And also are very active across the country and even uh, in internationally on some renewable energy and sustainability uh, modeling and accounting projects. Thank you. Uh, Brownie. It's like you're muted still, Brownie. Hey. Uh, Brownie Newman, I'm the chair of the Buncombe County Commission. Thank you. And Eliza. Hey, everyone. I'm Eliza Stokes. Uh, I'm an organizer and the communications manager at Mountain True. We're an environmental nonprofit uh, working in Western North Carolina and Northern Georgia. Thanks, Eliza. Um, let's see. Jason Walls. Hello, everybody. Um, Jason Walls, a district manager here in Asheville with Duke Energy. You're going to see me with my camera off today because it is exam week in our house. And we have, um, I have one son that is upstairs taking a, um, an exam. So we're, we're all taking steps to manage bandwidth today. Nice. <laughs> Wise use there. Did I miss anyone else that's uh, on the Blue Horizons Project Community Council? Um, seeing none, looks like we have two pages of people here. All right. Um, since we have still, still a little bit of time, I'd love to be able to just start real quick um, hear from this quick intro from the other people on the, because there's just so many passionate people here. Um, I'm just calling people since um, it makes it go smoother. First, I want to start with our, our um, great county and city sustainability staff folks. So, Jeremiah. Hey, everyone. I'm Jeremiah Leroy. I'm the sustainability officer for Buncombe County. Uh, I'm going to do my best today uh, not to look really grumpy. I just had my wisdom teeth taken out. So I'm, I'm tired <laughs> and my face hurts. So if I look like I'm 
upset. It's not personal. Uh, I'm just a little sore. So I'll do my best today, but it's, uh, it's good to see everybody. I commend you for being here, Jeremiah. Thanks. Um, Amber. Hey, uh, Amber Weaver, City of Asheville's Office of Sustainability. Thank you. And Bridget. Bridget Herring, Energy Program Coordinator with the City Office of Sustainability. Great. And Kira. Hi, all. I'm Kira Boulan, the Sustainability Coordinator at the City of Asheville. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, and Laura. Laura Langham, North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. A lot of you are members, so hi. And Brad Rouse. Can't hear you, Brad. Yeah, uh, Brad Rouse. I'm a co founder of Energy Savers Network and uh, member of Citizens Climate Lobby and presenter with Climate Reality Project and uh, a, a recent author. So that's me. Thanks, Brad. Phil, uh, Phil Pritchard. Yeah. Uh, Phil Pritchard, concerned citizen. Great. Thank you. Rick and Judy. I'm Rick Clemente. I'm an energy engineer and trying to beat the drum on how we're the engineers before we're actually going to be able to eliminate carbon from our buildings. And Judy Siglin, uh, we're in business together. We've uh, installed geothermal and very interested in solar, which means net zero, and we have net zero foundation. So. Thank you. And here, Chris. Good afternoon, Chris Pellerine here. Um, I'm a member of SACI, as well as a energy manager uh, with Jones Lang LaSalle helping our clients uh, achieve their energy and sustainability goals. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Mr. Doyle. Speaking. Hello. Ned Doyle, Ned Doyle co-chair for the Energy Technology Committee. Thank you. And Ken Brain. Hi, I'm Ken Brame. I'm a local environmental and Sierra Club activist, really fo in, focusing on, uh, you know, climate change and renewable energy, my passions. Thank you. Uh, all right, Ken Halden. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Ken Halden with uh, Solar Crowdsource and based here in Asheville uh, in support of the Solar Eyes campaign. Great. Uh, Peter. Are you asking me about me? <laughs> yes, sir. All right, I'm an environmental engineer, professional uh, for many years, but in my retirement uh, role, I uh, chaired a municipal board and we built out geothermal and solar. So I'm here to testify to its advantages and hopefully can continue the good work of this group. Thank you. Uh, Keith McDade, hello. Hi, uh, I'm Keith. I am also a member of SACI and I teach in and run the sustainability studies program at Lenore Ryan University here in Asheville. Thanks. Uh, Beatrice. Hi, I'm Beatrice Nathan. I'm the new community engagement coordinator for the Blue Horizons Project. All right, and let's see, a few of you left. Uh, Bill Fleming. Can't hear you, Bill. I don't know if you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I'm a design build engineer, combining building science and efficient buildings with all forms of energy, including district energy systems. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm also a member of SACI, and I'm interim co-director of sustainability at UNC Asheville. Oh, fantastic. Hi. Steve. Uh, was that me? Yes. Hey, uh, I'm Steve Barron. I live in East Asheville. 
I have a uh, background in uh, renewable energy regulatory issues. And, uh, I sit in on uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, some of the renewable energy meetings uh, such as this from time to time. Thank you. Um, and Laura Flower. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, I'm an educator and background in aerospace engineering, but very active in the environmental space. So just here to support the community. Thank you. Uh, Eileen? Are you able to introduce yourself? Here you are. Sorry, hi, I'm Eileen Comerford. Um, I live in East West Asheville and I work remotely for a wind energy company in Ohio. Um, so I'm really interested in the incorporation of renewable energy here in Asheville. Thank you. Uh, ben Edwards. Hey, I'm a uh, building energy modeler and codes and standards developer and uh, just eavesdropping, trying not to cause trouble. <laughs> All right, thanks Ben for being here. Don Moreland. Yeah, hi everybody, Don Moreland uh, with Solar Crowdsource and working on the Solarize Asheville Buncombe County campaign. Yeah. Uh, Julie Roper. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Roper, the Economic Development and Local Government Manager for Dominion Energy. Thank you, Julie, for being here. Amy. Our last person. Not sure who. Um, Amy, if you're there, you can introduce yourself. Hey, can you hear me? I can, yes. Sorry, I just like got into the meeting. Um, I'm Amy Musser. I have a company called Vanda Musser Design that um, certifies green buildings um, and does green residential consulting in Asheville. Thank you, Amy. So um, welcome everyone. We're not gonna do the intros um, every time. I just wanted to give everyone a sense of who else is on the call because we have the folks from the Blue Horizon Project Community Council and a staff working on this. But as you can tell, there's a lot of people that are passionate and experienced about energy issues here. So um, we all want to work together because there's, you know, the groups has been identified, but then there's just so many of us in this community that are really skilled in this space. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna move through our agenda now. Um, the first thing we need to do is approve the November meeting minutes. So um, this, is there a motion to approve those minutes? Lauren. I can motion to approve them. Okay. Anyone um, want to second that? I'll second. I'll second it. Cool. Any any opposed? No. That means everyone's in favor. All right. Good. All right. So um, the next thing we want to do is we want to discuss potential new members and compensation for community members who are not compensated by their jobs to attend. Um, so when the Blue Horizons Project Community Council Charter was created, which you all have, and which is also listed in our agenda, um, we essentially, that were the group that kind of came together to create that, identified several positions, the types of roles for folks to play. Um, when we selected everybody, we actually left space for a couple of people. And one of the reasons was, is that we realized that um, we're a pretty white group um, and we have, you know, we have a lot of energy expertise, but we need more both diversity of, of, of thought and background, ethnicity and things like that. And so we um, wanted to be able to um, potentially include a couple more people. So what I wanted to do is kind of open up to the folks that are on the community council um, for discussion related to any um, potential new members they would like to nominate to join this group. <laughs> Sam, I was gonna say, uh, I, don't, I see uh, um, Alicia Reardon's name is on some of the emails and I, I don't know if that's, she's already involved through the county, but uh, herself and her uh, energy analyst, Sierra Milosh, are um, 
could be two fantastic candidates. I don't, but I, that may already be they may already be involved or be part of the circle. Or. She's on on the Green Build Alliance board, mm -hmm. and so by the board being the entity that kind of um, chose the council, um, that she basically was a liaison to this group. So she's kind of included on the emails. Okay, um, she, won't, she won't be joining it. Yeah, and then the other person I was thinking of was, was Mary Love. So I haven't reached out to her, but she was the first home energy rater in Asheville. Uh -huh. um, she's in real estate now. I haven't, I haven't talked to her in many years, but um, just a, just in passing thought, but I've not heard, gauged her interest. That's okay. Yeah. You know, Mary. Mary's a, you know, we don't have a real estate professional on the mm -hmm. council this time. So um, yeah, and she's, she's great. She's got time and energy for this sort of thing. I think um, she's actually interested in joining the Green Alliance board again. I'm communicating with her today because she reached out to me. She's been on our board two or three times. We are looking potentially for someone that um, works in affordable housing um, and, you know, people of color as well. Those are sort of the two a couple of the gaps that we're looking for. So if anyone, you know, um, has anyone they want to recommend that, you know, does that kind of work or any other you know, folks that you can, you can recommend them now, we can also, we can leave it open and you can, you know, email the group and say, I recommend this person, and then we can reach out to them and, and engage their interests as well. But, um, you know, we do, you know, we do have a couple of spaces open for, you know, for folks that um, might be unrepresented. I'm looking also at the, the list, because mostly we're, you know, we're covered on utility, government staff, public sector, large employers, commercial, uh, we have nonprofit, um, renewable energy installer, energy efficiency professionals. We have all those alternative fuel transportation. We have all those folks represented on the council already, but the biggest gaps right now are um, minority voices and affordable housing providers. So uh, we wanted to put out to the group to see if anyone had any recommendations. Any recommendations on other organizations to contact? So has anybody talked to Pisco Legal Services? I know that they do a lot of work in that group that, um, and I could reach out to them if you'd like me to. You have a contact there? I do. Okay, yeah. Um, It'd be great for yeah, let's maybe you and I to to talk to that person, or you can initiate the contact. But we haven't talked to them yet. Um, and yeah, we kind of need to get out of the current sphere we're working in. So some like people, physical legal services would be a good good entity. Yeah. Have you talked to like um, the people at Mountain Housing Opportunities? I was kind of just getting in touch with them uh, the last few days. I wonder. If um, I have one contact there that runs the home repair program. His name's Lee. Um, and, but, you know, someone that's actually on the development side of things might be a good person to include. So if you have another contact. I'll, there. I'll talk to like Scott or Jeffrey or something. Okay. About them the other day. Okay, great. Yeah, MHO being the kind of leading local affordable housing developer, they would be great to have included in these conversations. Okay. Um, and think on this. So, you know, I'm not necessarily hearing a lot of other ideas come through, but um, we, you know, we are interested in adding a couple more people that, that fulfill those roles. So if you have any other ideas, please feel free to reach out to myself and Sophie and we can, we can take the initiative on con contacting those people. Okay. And I think I just want to mention that um, we, since we've lost Julie Mayfield as our city council and city appointee, um, we are waiting on the city's appointment process to appoint a new city um, representative. So that will be one member who will be joining us and we'll hear about that um, fairly soon, I expect. But yes, please do keep combing your Rolodexes or brains for um, anyone else who would be good to have on this council to increase our um, diversity of opinion and thought and um, our reach. And so if you, you wanna go ahead and uh, talk about the um, compensation piece as well, that's available. 
Sure. Um, this isn't formalized yet, but um, Blue Horizons Project is proposing to compensate community members who are not otherwise compensated for their time for participation in any of the Blue Horizons Project's activities or groups. And this could be um, this community council. It could be a steering committee that we're putting together for our Solarize campaign, uh, potentially even the tech working group. But we want to make sure that um, folks are getting compensated for their time. And if they're not getting paid by their organizations or any other entity, um, that's something that we wanna be able to do at $25 an hour. So I'm working on putting together a formalized policy for this to encourage more community member participation um, because we feel that community member participation is just as valuable as official organizational participation in, in doing this kind of work. So look out for more on that, but um, maybe as you're thinking of community members or different folks that you would think of bringing onto this council, um, you can mention that there's compensation available if no other compensation is being received um, for those community members. Right. Sophie, would that require a person to opt in? Opt in in what, in what sense, Dave? Would somebody need to let us know that they want to be compensated? Yes. Yeah, Mike, Sophie mentioned it's typically for folks that, um, you know, they might not have a job that pays for their presence here, or they, they need that financial support to actually should be able to, to appear because, you know, maybe they have other expenses, they need to get childcare or something else, or they just need, you know, they're trying to piece together their, um, for support and we have, you know, this kind of emerged from the work on the steering committee with the solar Rise campaign that we want to get more diverse voices in there and, and some folks that don't necessarily have typical jobs um, that, you know, are piecing together more gig economy type work or something like that. So, Yeah, I think the idea behind it is that if not being paid to show up is a barrier for showing up to some folks um, that we want to make make that easier on folks and encourage participation that way. All right, cool. Um, all right, so the next thing on our agenda is the charter. So this charter, this has been, was formulated by um, the, the group of the Energy Innovation Task Force and then the EITF as a whole reviewed it and talked about it. But you know, this is essentially the guiding document for this community council. And it's, um, it's, you know, it's pretty important for you know, the, the goals that we have and the types of work we do and things like that. And we haven't had a chance to talk about it in this particular format uh, with, you know, as a group and together. So um, I hope that everyone's had a chance to look at it. And I'm not gonna read it because that would take you know, quite a while and you probably get bored and start checking your email or something else while I'm doing that. So, um, I'm going to essentially at this point, you know, open it up to any questions or comments, because this document can be modified by this group if you see fit. Um, but it really, you know, it helps guide the work, the day to day work that we do as Blue Rising Project Community Council staff, and as you know, as your group too, you know, like what you work on. So I'll stop talking and just see if there's any questions or comments about the charter. And, and it's actually a link in the I could pull it up on screen share, but you know, it's a link in your, um, you know, in the agenda itself, so. I can go ahead and share it too. Okay. So yeah, any questions or comments on it? Yeah, Sam, I had a one thought here, um, yeah. just basically with a purpose. And you know, when I read this, you know, I think the one thing to, to me is just, you know, perhaps we can add some um, verbiage of just saying, community-wide goal you know, to, of reducing our demand so that we can get to 100% renewable energy. I don't know what people's thoughts are on that, but it kind of uh, inc includes efficiency in that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe that was, I think we talked about that when we created this and some, I can't remember who was mentioning it, but they were saying kind of the ener energy efficiency and renewables is kind of you know, both, both pieces have to hold hands to get us to 100% renewable. 
Um, but it's, you know, if it feels like it was really important to call that out and put that in there, yeah, we're, you know, that, that's definitely um, possible in the prerogative of the community council. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to hear what other people's thoughts are on the phone. Sounds like we have a lot of both got representations from both renewables and efficiency folks. Mm -hmm. Curious to hear their thoughts. This is Rick. May I say something? Well, um, let's let the community council go first. We just have we've gotten the feedback before that we need to like kind of keep the public comments separate just for managing the meeting. So I would love to hear your comments, Rick. Oh, let's just get the community council to speak first, okay? That's possible. Any, so this, any is, this is Keith. And I was wondering, and this is still just in the purpose. Right now with collaboration with Buncombe County, the city of Asheville and Duke Energy. I was wondering if we need to add the potential for other energy partners to move in. Um, I mean, specifically, um, I was thinking Dominion Energy because when the council started, Dominion Energy wasn't here. Um, and so there are potential for other energy partners to move in the area. Um, I'm sure we could change it in the future, and I don't know if we want to put that in this now. Um, but as it evolves and moves forward, it would be good to be able to incorporate them in. That was just one thought. Um, not point. to put Julie on the spot because she's with Building Dominion Energy. That was coincidental. <laughs> Our... I think that helps. I think that's interesting, Keith. I mean, I don't know. I think, I, I guess for me, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm probably playing a little bit of catch up here. This is a really busy time of year for us. But um, so like, are we talking about net zero? I mean, how are we talking about getting there? I mean, because 100% renewable energy is kind of potentially kind of vague. I mean, I don't know. Too, like that kind of goes to what David's saying too, like offsets, energy efficiency. Um, I guess maybe not. Maybe maybe that's fine. Maybe that's down in the below. Maybe that's somewhere out down below. And yeah, that is that does strike me. Actually, interesting. What if, what if uh, in the next twenty years we get like a RTO and we can? There's other players in the power market that we're potentially buying energy from or something. You know, maybe we should keep the organizations we're focusing, we're working with. Uh, it, you know, in more vague, like Keith saying, mm -hmm. or just I guess we can just change it over time as we go too. You could, but yeah, now's the time to yeah. If you want to broaden it, that's that's definitely, you know, that's it's something to consider. Um, yeah, you know, cool. like yeah. Just and how are we going to get the day? How are we going to get the community to follow the county and the and the city? You know, that seems like a, a really an interesting one yeah it's a it's a yeah it's a big change needed and it also includes transportation as well it's not just buildings but transportation uh, sectors so i i have a big thought about this so the low income solar thing i want to think talk about too but maybe we, when we get down to the uh the deliverables <clears throat> I just want to chime in. Um, so I co-chair the WNC Renewables Coalition and uh, something that that group had mentioned um, when we were looking at this charter before its approval was that some community members were a little uncomfortable with the idea of this leading the renewable energy work, um, which is a little bit of a nitpick, but I think something like assisting the community might be um, a little more inviting for for some organizers who have been doing this kind of work for a while. Um, ironically, the other, <laughs> the other major uh, point we had was to make meetings accessible remotely, which clearly we're all doing because of COVID. Um, but if there's a way to make sure that that would be possible if and when things go back to be nor to normal, I think that would be great. I would, I would second a change to leading, to assisting for sure. I like that. Uh... That approach. Good feedback. I, I have a little bit of a bias towards keeping the number of people 
who are required to be in it by being in the purpose statement to a minimum. Um, just from the standpoint of unwieldiness, if, if you get too many people who are required to be in it, then it can get out of hand. Gotcha. I didn't understand that, that that's what that's getting at. That makes a lot of sense. And there will be, there's also something called the bylaws and the bylaws will be drafted and that's, um, that'll be something like, you know, more kind of process and detail oriented things about like how the community council uh, manages itself to the membership and the number. And I mean, the charter is kind of like supposed to be the guy and document and, and give some specifics around the, the workflow and the work task um, and the bylaws will, um, yeah, we'll provide more details around just the community council itself. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, draft that and send that to y'all to talk about before the next meeting. Um, this is Sophie. Would it be helpful if um, to foster the collaboration on thoughts and editing of the charter if you know we emailed around to Google Doc for folks to input their comments um, outside of the meeting or Possibly it occurred to me that maybe even scheduling a work session on the charter and bylaws might be um, warranted, but I'm curious because I do want to make sure that all the council members are in approval of the charter and then the subsequent bylaws. I think a Google Doc for the for the wordsmithing stuff is makes a lot of sense, you know. I feel like um, yeah, you know, and then maybe, you know. Okay. All right. We'll I'm comfortable with that idea, Sophie. I think that it, 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 and then we can come back to it and have a discussion about these ideas. That that does make sense to me. Okay. Great. All right. Um. Let's see, we are a little ahead on this item. So I know that Rick wanted to say something about it. So I'll go ahead and take uh, Rick's comment now. Well, I was trying to circle back just into the Blue Horizons project um, uh, statement goal or whatever it's called. Purpose. Well, when, um, and we don't have to, I'm just saying, I think that needs to be addressed in this purpose. Um, because I do recall in the meeting that established this document or the final meeting of the EITF, uh, that, that question of renewable energy versus including energy efficiency or whether we transitioned, said it should transition to a carbon oriented statement um, was definitely discussed. And I believe that the, the consensus was that leaving it at renewable energy alone was not correct. So I, I think that it, it does need to change. And I thought it was changed at that meeting. And I think making it in line with the Blue Horizons project is the appropriate thing. So I would say refer back to that because there was an offline attention and joint involvement in creating that statement. And it should align. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Um, yes, Brad. Um, yeah, um, just a couple of things on that same subject. Um, you know, the reason that the gold is 100% renewable energy, which I don't necessarily agree with that personally or, you know, intellectually versus other goals we might have, but it's the goal that was, it was, the, it's the goal that was established by the city and the county. So that's the official goal of the city and county. So that's why we are at 100% renewable energy. So that's where the, the, the political leaders in the county want us to go. Um, the, um, uh, the other thing that I would just mention is that uh, I think somebody brought up the question of, well, what does it really mean? And, um, you know, what does that 100% renewable energy really mean? Uh, and there is an open question. Uh, there was a study done um, which, uh, for the city which outlined that, um, the Cadmus report, uh, which is what we have to go on at this point uh, of what it really means. Um, but I think that was lacking too. And so I just want to mention to Sam, you might want to talk about just the ideas that we're formulating around doing a strategic plan that would lay some of the groundwork uh, for that out. Yeah, 
Okay. Well, that's where it should be covered in a strategic plan. Right. Okay. Um, any other comments on that piece on the, the charter? I Did have you? one little comment on the charter. Excuse me. Go ahead, Bob. I can't see it right here. You can do it, Phelps. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, I was just thinking, I've just been thinking a little bit about uh, solar and, and rooftop solar and how it's really expensive and how there's all kinds of permitting issues and red tape and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, I got this cool thing in my, in my, in the mail from Duke Energy where you can buy solar from Duke Energy for, for really affordable prices. You know, I think for like a normal power bill, it's like $24 a month. You can, you can go solar on your bill and, uh, mm -hmm. You know, with 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 one of the systems that we sell, I mean, at market price, I mean, this is a way better deal, even if I pay it until I die, you know. And so I just wonder if like we shouldn't be like raising money for to like have a fund to like I don't know because I don't know like maybe we don't. So you know, I kind of <laughs> I kind of waver on a good day. I'm, I feel like I'm selling hope, and on a bad day, I feel like I'm selling hood ornaments, you know, and and. Uh, or, or so, so I don't know. I just feel like rooftop is is an interesting piece. You know, I think I think potentially if we can drive, you know, if we if we can, to me we should focus on removing barriers. Uh, you know, like I feel like my friend Aaron Greer was 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 uh, talking to Brownie the other day, and uh, he said Brownie was blowing his mind about how solar in Australia costs ten thousand dollars for a twenty thousand dollar system here, and it's like, you know, my engineer brought us a nice bottle of Woodford Reserve, you know, it's cool that I have to give them like 1% of all of my deals, but, uh, and it was nice to get the bottle of whiskey, but, uh, you know, for something that when you put it on the roof, it makes it structurally stronger. It's weird that you have to get an engineer to sign off and, you know, the, the you know, we pay Duke Energy for interconnection, we pay the Utilities Commission, we, you know, we pay the uh, jurisdiction that we're in and tons of paperwork to do these jobs. And I, I just, so I don't know, like, one cool idea is like doing solar under the guise of the utility that's regulated differently. So if like, if, if we could like, like install solar for Duke Energy, I mean, that's probably a bridge too far, but I'm just thinking like, I don't know, like, I don't know, rather than like doing a bunch of, and, and, and rooftops never the full piece of the pie. I mean, like on some of these like affordable housing apartment buildings and stuff, like you fill the roof and it, all it does is take a chunk out of the, uh, the the you know the common area load or whatever you know let alone like the the units so it's like maybe instead of focusing on low income rooftop we should focus on like some other mechanism for community solar or something like that and and, and removing barriers to, to make it as affordable as possible so that it can always have its place in grid resiliency and stuff like that but i just think this whole one panel at a time thing isn't is isn't gonna get us one system at a time thing isn't gonna is is is, is thinking too small. Yeah, that's sort of where my brain's been going. Thanks, hey. something that Brad mentioned before is that we um we just got some money from the Candida Fund to to do some work on a strategic strategic plan for 100 renewables. So to be able to look at these various pieces on what's it gonna take to get there and kind of a timeline of implementation and. Because you're right, you can't just we have to like do an all of the above sort of approach, but we have we can also have to focus our energy on the most impactful things too. So so that's cool. So so, so tell me that say that again. So we we we've got somebody doing a strategic plan for us. There's going to be um, part of this group, the community council is going to be working on a, a strategic plan for 100% renewables, um, and then in terms of the actual you know the work, it'll be. Um, myself and Brad Rouse and also South Face from Atlanta will be working on kind of technical side of things and a little bit of policy stuff. But then this group, you know, as a whole, will be working on like, how do we, you know, what are the elements of the plan? What are, you know, how do we actually transition the plan to actually the work to be done? Um, so this will, that'll be a major product of this group here. And, and, and that's a consulting firm, South Face? Like an energy consulting firm. Yeah, it's a nonprofit based in Atlanta that, that does sustainability work, and they do a lot of policy policy work, and they they write plan. They help you know communities write plans for for the transition to clean energy. That's great. Okay, that, okay cool. Well, I just 
it sounds like I'm just getting on the train here, but um, this is this is that's great. Yeah. Hey Sam, can I share a couple of quick thoughts? Go ahead, Ryan. Okay. Um, first, I would just say, you know, I think if you if if a person reads the whole charter, you know, I think it's pretty clear that uh, supporting more deployment of renewable energy and energy efficiency are both, you know, core aspects of the purpose of the organization, but not everybody does read the whole thing. So maybe there is some value in um, including a little bit of language right up there in the purpose uh, that references energy efficiency too, just so if somebody doesn't read the whole document right away, they know that we want to transition to renewables, but a key strategy of that is to just reduce the overall amount of energy we need and that energy efficiency is you know the central strategy to uh, to do that. So that's just one one thought. And then just to um, maybe just share some high level comments around you know the 100% renewable policy from the county standpoint. I mean, obviously it's this kind of revolutionary goal um, with many you know many parts uh, to be you know to be figured out over time. But at a high level, you know, I think some of the principles that um, that the county is really supportive of, and I think I think that you know the city as well, is we you know we do have a preference for as much of this happening um, locally as possible, right? Like we want to do things here. We don't just want to you know pay someone to plant a tree somewhere else. Not that that's a bad thing. And and at the end of the day, you know there may need to be elements of both. I mean we do face real challenges here. I mean um, as we think about transitioning society from fossil fuels into renewables, some areas have big advantages, you know, like Nevada has big advantages, you know, other areas, um, you know, um, it'll be, it'll be more challenging just because of the resources they have. And, you know, and really urbanized areas face challenges of their own because we don't have a lot of cheap, flat, open land. So some of the utility scale projects that are driving a lot of the rapid change to renewables at very low prices you know, there's going to be opportunities to do that here, but much more limited than, you know, really rural areas and, and, and things like that. So, uh, but we do want to do as much as we can locally. Um, and there was just this interesting uh, article, I shared it with uh, some of the folks on this group, and maybe they could post it, or Sophie, maybe you already posted it, but there was an interesting study that just came out that showed, like, you know, based on what we know now, like, transitioning to 100% renewables or something very close to that, Ultimately, it's going to be a combination of large utility scale projects, as well as a very significant percentage of smaller decentralized projects actually achieves it at the lowest cost, because even though, as Phelps says, you know, smaller rooftop projects are definitely a little more expensive to install, um, by generating power where it's used, it reduces the amount of, you know, future upgrades to transmission that will ultimately be required. So, so anyway, I just wanted to share some of those high-level thoughts. I think we're going to need a lot of all of these different elements to be successful in Buncombe County. I'd love to see that study. Is that where your post? When you post something, what does that mean, Sophie? Um, I posted it on Facebook, I think, a few days ago, maybe. But I'm going to drop it here in the chat as well. And and interestingly, it showed that the combination of, de of, of, of distributed generation and utility scale is not just the cheapest strategy to get to all renewables, it's cheaper than business as usual fossil fuels. So um, anyway, check it out. It's a really interesting article. Awesome. So I want to go back to what Phelps said about removing barriers a little while ago. And I was wondering, um, as we look at the charter and the guiding principles, I don't think anything in the guiding principles really covers that. And, and that's just a really pretty baseline thing to helping this change community-wide if we remove these barriers. So I don't know if we want to try to put that and think about putting something that covers that under the guiding principles or not. Um, I think that's a great idea. Me too. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, yep. So the, the chart will be shared on Google Doc for everyone um, to be able to get 
further comments as well. Okay. All right, the, the next thing on our agenda is discussing future working groups. So um, for everyone's uh, kind of background, when the EITF was started, we had a, a peaker plant working group, a uh, group of folks that were looking at like what is the actual demand energy in our region and how does that translate into actually needing a peaker plant or not? Um, that was one working group. And that was kind of a, you know, that working group has essentially served its purpose for um, providing the, the data needed to understand like where is our demand coming from and what is needed. Um, and then there was a programs working group that looked at all the Duke Energy programs and other programs and like what's available um, and how do we promote those programs and ideas for other things as well. Um, and then there was a community engagement working group uh, tasked with communications and outreach and those sort of things. And then there was a technology working group. Um, from those original four working groups, the technology working group is the only one that still remains and is still meeting and, you know, moving things forward. Um, the other three, you know, kind of served their purpose during that time and transitioned out. Um, but now we wanted to basically open it back up to, to the folks on this call to see, we, we, we had the thought of like, whether or not we wanted to do a separate you know, 100% renewable energy working group to work on the plan or another community engagement working group or something else. We just wanted to kind of, you know, open it up to the folks to see whether or not there was capacity or desire to create more working groups. That way, you know, a smaller group could focus on some things versus, and then that group would then bring things back to this larger body here. I don't want to create more meetings just to have more meetings, but I think that um, sometimes that can be helpful. So we wanted to introduce that idea and then put it out to you to see um, what people's thoughts are. So yeah, I already so feel I, like I, I'm I, talking a lot. Um, for me, I, I, I don't feel like, you know, we've been two meetings into this and then I really don't feel like I have a good personal feeling of what groups we need out there. I mean, certainly a community engagement group seems to make sense, but I'm, I just feel like I'm a little bit new to this committee to, to uh, know or have a good feeling for that. I, would Sam, like to Sam, I was going to say that um, I have a real strong preference for for ad hoc committees, in, in a, form a, a permanent committee, just to have a permanent committee always seems to waste a lot of time. I, I really like a committee to have a, a definitive goal. Okay, thanks Dave. Ken, did you wanna say something? Well, getting back to Keith's point a little bit, I just wanted to make sure, again, I sent you an email earlier regarding, you know, some, I'm a, I'm a new member, obviously, I'd like to get a little more background into some of the, like some of the decisions that have been made already and where we got to, how we got to where we are today. So I feel, you know, that I'm not treading ground that maybe has already been covered. So to the extent that, uh, you know, maybe there's an onboarding process or something, we have a, a, some sort of a small group that could come up so that we could feel like we're coming up to speed quicker is all I was gonna mention. Okay. Yes, Ned, did you have something? No. Well, uh, just from a somewhat historical perspective, oddly enough at this time, the other three working groups that we had, which you just noted, uh, did a fine job. They, they achieved their objectives and kind of wrapped things up. Uh, the community engagement aspect is pretty much uh, transitioned over to the Blue Horizons project and, and so forth and the folks working that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so I, and I, I forgot who mentioned it, but uh, I think we should leave the door open to other working groups and so forth for sure, but let's identify a need for them, some specific objective rather than just saying, well, you know, we need to engage more of the community or whatever. I, 
the, the four working groups that started, three of the four completed their task and working with the technology working group, we're still collectively kind of up to our ears and things to do. So it's a little bit different. We, I don't know how we'll ever get done, but we've got specific issues, which I'll update you on, uh, I guess another 10 or 15 minutes. So um, let's identify the need for the other committees before we worry too much about putting some together ad hoc or otherwise, my thought. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Sam, can I make a suggestion for a, a working group? Sure. Go ahead, Jorge. Yeah, I, I, what, one thing I would love to see from this group um, is a subcommittee that could identify um, not financial barriers, but uh, an idea I got from an uh, exchange I had with Sophie re recently, which is, you know, what types of financial instruments, financial tools um, from places like Self-Help Credit Union could help um, accelerate the deployment of renewables in this community, uh, residentially speaking and commercially. You know, what credit enhancements, what types of loans, what, what types of, um, you know, warehousing of loans might help uh, this community deploy uh, more renewables in more places more quickly. And that, that would span, you know, all income levels. So that's something I'd, I'd really be interested in. Um, thank you. Yep. Sounds good. And I just want to mention that we do have a, um, you know, a draft scope of work for 100% renewables plan. Um, and the financing piece is a part of that. Um, I, we will share that with everyone. And, you know, there's a lot more work to be done on it. But we just heard recently that we got, we got a grant from the Candido Fund to help us pay for that. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's many different components of that plan. And so we, we could envision, you know, perhaps a small group works on that. But yeah, you know, financing is definitely a, a, an essential part in making that a reality. Um, yes, yes, Brad. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, just in thinking of the groups, strategic, strategic planning group, which you just mentioned, definitely we need that while we're, I mean, just to get input from the community council into the strategic planning process, um, we need uh, probably, um, maybe coming out of the strategic planning process, we'll identify some ad hoc groups, um, but I can already imagine that, um, you know, we might wanna have an EV electrification group that focuses on electrification specifically in transportation, but also in, in, uh, in uh, heating and process heat and other, other things that we've got to do to get to 100% renewable. Um, and then Solarize campaign. I mean, I guess you've already got a group there. So I, th I really like Dave's idea of, really have an ad hoc groups that kind of evolve over time uh, with, without too many standing groups uh, that just meet because, oh, we're supposed to, you know, not, cross a T and dot an I and, and not doing anything real. Yeah, okay. Great. Thanks for using the chat, y'all. See that people are dropping comments in there, so. Thank you for that. Um, okay. And we are, so Sophie and Beatrice are taking minutes for the meeting as well. So, you know, all this stuff is captured and, um, too, and we're recording it as well. So, all right. Um, Sam, I'll, I'll just say real quick too. I feel like uh, once once we hear from Ned, I think some of the new members like, like myself and the others might probably have a little better idea of what's been going on. I think that'll probably certainly help us. Um, and then looking ahead to your agenda for January, you know, one of the there's a, there's a topic overview of residential and commercial efficiency. So that there's some potential for a group out of that too. But like, like everyone has pointed out, you know, this is kind of certainly some possibilities there. I don't think, I don't think there will be no shortage of working groups. All right, good. Um, why don't we, if everyone's cool with it, we'll transition to the next item on the agenda, which is the, um, this member updates and, um, the one we have already kind of identified as Ned doing one on the tech working group. Well, I, I'm prepared, uh, but I'm looking at the time. Uh, my co-chair, uh, John Landy, uh, indicated he was not going to be available until four o'clock due to another meeting. Uh -huh. Could somebody take the lead for about six or eight minutes and see if he shows up? 
I'm ready to go, but I, it, we're, we're, I'm looking at 356. So if someone, a few other folks have updates, and I, I believe I can do what I've got to do here in, in five or eight minutes or so. So I'm punt if it's possible. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, a time for anyone that's on the BHPCC to, to provide any updates on projects you're working on or things that will be relevant to the community council um, as a whole. So open it up. Yeah, I, I, I'd actually like to request um, that Laura Brower give us a, a little update or Bill Fleming, a little update about the uh, critical services microgrid group. Would one of y'all be willing to do that? Yeah, Laura, I'd, be, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, Laura, go. Yeah, um, I guess we, we've had a small group of people come together, Bill and Dave um, and a few others outside this group who have some experience in either microgrids specifically with David's electric vehicles. And um, we've been looking at downtown buildings in the city of Asheville as a potential pilot for a microgrid and trying to develop um, a list of sort of the benefits that would be there for Asheville and connect more with the city and county to see if there can be a uh, cost benefit analysis done for that, um, just to improve upon the solar investments that they've already made. So that's sort of just been in the background as we slowly um, get the story together and, and connect more with people. Happy to field questions. We're hoping to do like a quick um, webinar that can be out on the web so people have a little more background information on uh, what we're developing. Anything you guys want to add to that? Great. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Thank you for getting involved with it. Yeah, you guys are all great. This People in this community have, have consistently shown up with a lot of skills and a lot of heart. So I'm happy to be a part of it too. So when you say downtown buildings, are these microgrids that would be housed in buildings or? It, um, it's like basic, yeah, basically a microgrid has the additional infrastructure of um, storing the energy and having a software management system so that you can weather an outage, let's say, or optimize your energy usage among different um, aspects of the building that are using it. So a, a pilot, a first stage would be something, you know, very small, maybe connecting two different buildings that already have solar slated for them and showing that one of them has a critical service that could then be sustained if there was a long term a long term outage. So it's all that's all part of a discussion we want to have with people in the city and county and Great. hopefully um, that answered some of what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious if uh, speaking of that, is there any updates from the, the city or the county about the, the solar RFP and kind of how that's going and you know that um, MB Haynes was selected and I'm sure you're doing a lot of engineering right now, but um, any sense on, yeah, how that's going would be great. Yeah, I can give you a quick update um, and, you know, there's not a whole lot going on. It's, you know, the process of going through contract. I mean, everything takes a long time, but we're there. We've already had our kickoff meeting. Haynes is working on a schedule for all of these facilities. We have had, um, I mean, honestly, the, the biggest issue thus far has been uh, the actual procurement of the panels themselves. Uh, the market for these things is, it moves very, very quickly. <laughs> so we've had like twice already. Um, you know, uh, the vendors say, hey, we've got, you know, X number of megawatts of, you know, uh, 380 panels available, let's go for it. And then within 48 hours before we can verify, you know, and get through our, our processes internally, 
they tell us those are gone already. <laughs> so now we got to move to this next one and it like keeps, it starts the process over again. So it's, that's been a little bit of a challenge, um, but we're, we're there. I think we've all agreed on, um, we've had to go to a higher wattage panel. We're moving and getting that procurement done. So, you know, I'm shocked at how fast these things are flying off the shelf, which is good, right? Like it's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, given that it's our first foray into doing any solar project, much less, you know, 40 at one time, um, you know, we're learning as we go. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 you know, things are going well uh, and we, we fully expect to have boots on the ground. I mean, the next big step for us, on, other than procuring the panels, obviously, is the Duke interconnection process, uh, which can be, you know, cumbersome at times. Uh, but Duke's been really good working with us. Uh, they've assigned us, you know, a specific person within their interconnection team that we can work with. Uh, and so that's a big help when we have questions and need answers uh, quickly. We've gotten those, you know, turned around pretty quickly, but even so the interconnection process can take several months, you know, and we can't build anything until we get that interconnection agreement. So, you know, we're, we're working through that process. And of course the interconnection agreement also means we get the rebate opportunity. So, you know, those, those things kind of coincide sort of order of operations. Once we get our unique identifier number that you're, in the queue for interconnection, then we can start applications for rebates. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, the, the big step for us right now is interconnection, you know, so it'll take a few months. And, and the last time we had a meeting about it, you know, cross our fingers, I'm always optimistic on timelines, uh, but, you know, we were talking construction beginning in March uh, on, on projects. I know the team that's coming in to do the installations is planning on being here full time and just knocking these things out uh, once we get those interconnections set and ready to go. So, you know, that's it. I mean, that's where we stand. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has them, but that's, that's kind of where we're at with it, so. You're, you're fully expecting to get the rebates, right? I mean, that's, you don't see that as an issue. I mean, uh, yeah, certainly, you know, um, the capacity for the program uh, is still very robust, right? Uh, for the nonprofit part of it specifically has been very, very underutilized. It's one of the kind of exciting things about um, applying for it is that we know there's a ton of capacity. And of course, you know, once January rolls around, additional capacity gets added to the program as well. Uh, and so, you know, we think that, that the capacity in the actual rebate program matches up pretty well with what we're going to be applying for. Obviously we can't guarantee that every single application we're going to submit gets approved, uh, but we expect the vast majority of it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's, oh, fingers crossed, man. That's a big one for me. <laughs> that's good. I think you're going to be fine. It seems like you could apply right now. As soon as you have, as soon as you put in your interconnection application for those uh, systems, you should be able to, Soak up yeah. everything that's left oh, and yeah. then get more. And more. Hand in hand, man, absolutely. Because uh, you know, I mean, it's all it's all about getting in the queue, right? Like once you're in line, you're good. Um, and and that's our plan is to get in the queue, absolutely as soon as humanly possible. Right. Man. It's complicated for sure. It sounds like. It's I don't mean to jump the gun by already asking about the next RFP, but I'm um, curious about like any sense of timeline for that, if, if it's helpful to kind of begin recruitment for schools or um, other entities that might be interested in participating like at any point in the next few months or if, if sure. you want well, to take we might kind of- We're already well underway, honestly. Oh, great. Yeah, so um, our, our goal, I don't want to get it too into the weeds on it, but like our goal is really to start to line up this process with our with our regular calendars as a county government when we make decisions on our, our capital improvement plan, uh, when we make decisions on our budgeting and do all that stuff so that like, you know, we're kind of in cycle with how the rest of the budget and everything works with the county. Uh, and so right now we've been working for the last several months on getting other local governments, Black Mountain, uh, you know, Town of Weaverville, we've been working with UNCA, um, you know, a few other partners, uh, the, the airport, uh, to go through the same process we did with all of the other schools and, and uh, the city and everything to, you know, get all of the upfront work done, you know, in terms of assessments, design work, structural engineering work, that sort of stuff, lining up for an RFP, hopefully to be released at the beginning of our fiscal year, 
which is July 1. So that's that's kind of the goal at this time. Though that said, it, you know, I'm not going to argue with you if you want to recruit on our behalf. Um, but, you know, we're, we're primarily sticking with public sector folks because we have, frankly, jurisdiction to work with public sector folks. We can't do as much with the, the private sector just from a statutory standpoint. We can only spend money on public stuff. Um, but that said, you know, the goal is to make this a cyclical thing, you know, and, and to continue to, to do this each and every year and to try and take advantage of it like we did the first time. I will say this, this go around will not be 50 projects, you know, like it's this, this first one was big uh, and very ambitious. And, and so, you know, we, we frankly took a big swing this first go around. So uh, it'll be, you know, maybe half that size. Um, we're still kind of figuring that out, but, you know, talk to your, talk to your friends, talk to your elected officials, you know, get them to, to buy, well, not the county folks, we already know they're in, but, uh, you know, the, the, some of the smaller communities in town um, also just don't have as many opportunities, they don't own as many buildings and, and that sort of thing, but, but we're working on it. Yeah, phase two is well underway. I'd love to hear more about the financing part of it and how all that works. Maybe now is not a good time. I don't know. So do you have specific questions about that? Like, like how it all works, like how, like how you're, what kind of return you're projecting and stuff like that. Like, like oh, how you're, are you going to borrow the money or are you going to? We already have, we already have. Um, so for the, for phase one, uh, it was a, a bond issuance. It was a debt issuance, right? So uh, the money is actually already, been approved by the county commission. It's been borrowed, and it's it's sitting there waiting to be spent. And actually, we've already gotten our first pay app, so they're already asking for money. We're cutting checks already. Uh, so yeah, that that was a debt issuance. Um, and I can actually, rather than get into the weeds on it, because I've got a lot of information on that, I can send you the presentation if you like uh, that we gave to the board that kind of runs through the numbers. You know, I think I, I, think I saw that, and maybe I can. I, I feel like my maybe i can hit you up about that sometime just through yeah that. anytime absolutely feel free to reach out you put a dollar sign in front of a number and i i fall apart so that's, <laughs> um, that's the end of the game. no worries did you guys get the uh, msd have you pinged the msd yes uh, i won't get into the details but yes we have talked to them <laughs> <Cool. laughs> mm. All right, great, Jeremiah. Uh, Ned, are you ready? I don't see John Landy on here, but would you like to go? Yeah, so I, I, I'm all set. Um, I don't see John on here either, so if he chimes in, that's fine. Um, I think it, uh, uh, Ken had asked about some of the background on technology, uh, something to that effect. Uh, Sophie and the Blue Horizons folks had a nice outline that was shared last meeting and I think prior. So for um, the folks interested in the background on the technology group, rather than go through it all, um, I'd recommend take a look at that. Uh, the summary is we've worked on approximately 18 different projects since uh, 2017 or so, um, in, primarily in collaboration with the city, the county, and Duke, obviously, uh, from computer apps to promoting projects and technical background and support and so forth. Um, currently, the, the prime focus in light of everything that's going on here is looking at the, the issue of Pratt and Whitney development project here in Buncombe County uh, that's proposed. There's a fair amount of material out on the background of it. Uh, the potential for allegedly 800, 1200 jobs and and so forth. So look into that. I won't take too much time with it. But the the bottom line, as it stands now, and I, I hope to clarify it a little bit, is that we really don't know. And there's a really strong potential that if this goes through the way it's currently appears to be going through, uh, we're back at ground zero in Western North Carolina for carbon goals and modernization, electrification, and so forth. Uh, there's uh, it's a million square foot facility, manufacturing, and it, it, 
it's not the same as growth from the standpoint of adding more residential or more hotels or so forth in a gradual sense. It's a huge project that kind of just pops up right out of nowhere, which isn't exactly true, but you know, that's the idea. Um, it will have as best as we can guess, I'm gonna come back to that, uh, a, a huge impact on electrical demand as well as an increase in natural gas usage uh, independently for the manufacturing process. Uh, uh, about eight weeks ago now, I think six to eight weeks ago, um, I sent out an email to the technology working group and there were a few others on there as well, uh, asking for their input and thoughts, essentially bullet point comments on what are some of the issues and that we can deal with address and support in a collaborative fashion with the county with with duke energy with pratt and whitney and so forth and uh so far i believe i've got six or seven uh responses out of the group with some excellent astoundingly high quality comments and materials and as I pointed out to somebody, the reason I asked for bullet points was to avoid getting too complex. And after eight people, seven, eight, seven or eight people with bullet points, I got about eight megabytes of files in reply. So um, there's, there's a difference between a technology group bullet point and what most people think it is. Now, and I'm gonna invite more uh, input on this, <clears throat> but the update on it at this point uh, taking advantage of the holidays, the COVID and so forth, where it's kind of slower here and a few conversations and re really looking into it. The upshot is, in a general sense, the technology groups that have been working on this, the input on it, uh, has, has stacks and stacks of answers. But we don't know what the right questions are. And for the for the, the fans of old time TV, or if you're old enough from Get Smart and Don Adams, there's something of a cone of silence that has descended over this project. And I'm working to reach out to a number of people, but changing course ever so slightly, rather than try to sit down with a lot of these contacts and a lot of these folks to present the whole buffet of different answers, I want to turn it around into asking questions to find out where we go so that which answers make the most sense for it. And uh, uh, micro tangent only because I'm, I'm looking at a smiling face. One of the areas we didn't get much on was transportation and EVs. So Dave, uh, Herb, if, if you are got a few moments to throw in some questions on that, it would be appreciated. Allegedly, a, a Somebody at one point said it'd be a 1200 car parking lot. Are we gonna have EVs? Are we gonna have chargers? Are there solar stations over the top, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of a thing. So um, the, the, I'm putting this together in, in, in an ongoing process. I invite anyone uh, to email me with their questions that would be posed to Pratt & Whitney, to Duke Energy, uh, to the county in order to, to facilitate really having an impact on this proposed project, but with the overarching idea that it's not just a one-off here. How are we gonna integrate storage and solar and renewables and manufacturing and transportation on a regional basis that it's not, it's not just, we're not going after Pratt & Whitney. We try to put it that way. We're trying to find out what's the best way that Duke Energy can profit from this by developing a, a modern infrastructure. How can profit with savings? Allegedly, they're, they're by this, because I'm told a lot of things, I still don't have actual answers to my questions, but um, they're going for silver lead certification for the building. Well, that's nice. Let's go for platinum, just as an example. Uh, and, and use this as, as something of a template for other development in the area. From what I gather, again, and I don't know if John has come on board, he might have something new, uh, Duke Energy uh, uh, commercial account folks and programs people uh, have been 
in touch and discussing this with Pratt and Whitney reps for well close to a year now. But he, again, as I can tell, it's business as usual. It's not just about giving them some high efficiency lights. We really need to look at this from the very beginning. How many panels can be put on the roof? Uh, as this grading and, and clearing begins, what's the feasibility for geothermal uh, on the site right now? It's way less expensive to do it up front and to come back later and say, well, dig up the parking lot. You know, it, it, sorry, I, I've got eight megabytes of material here that I've been going through. And uh, so it's, I get a lot of examples. So that's kind of the upshot. And, and the timeline, as I can understand it now, allegedly is mid-January to uh, early February before there's a, a, supposedly any real opportunity to sit down and discuss this with Pratt and Whitney and Duke. It's, it's the holidays and there's a few good reasons, but candidly, we're being recorded, so whatever. It's a stalling tactic right now, but full circle, I'm just about done here. We have the answers, but we need to ask the correct questions of the people uh, representing for the project. And hopefully we can work hand in hand and everybody wins. That's it, I'm, covers it. Thanks, Nat. Any questions or comments on that the project or what Ned was speaking to? Is it the is it the opinion um, of the folks in the know with Pratt and Whitney that it is a done deal and it is one hundred percent moving forward at this point? Yes, it is. Um, you know, and I think that uh, I'll just share a few thoughts. Um, you know, but that is a pretty recent decision, right? So they've been um, kind of, they've known they've wanted to do um, a big a big new facility to consolidate some of the different operations they have in a, one location. So they're not, you know, just building one thing here, driving it 500 miles, adding it to something else, driving 500 miles. So part of the idea of this large facility is sort of to consolidate more of their manufacturing in a single location um, for, you know, efficiency purposes in the manufacturing process. Um, and they look at, you know, locations all across, um, you know, many states, many, uh, many, many parts of the country, and uh, ultimately selected North Carolina and Buckham County. Um, and so that's been approved um, from the, you know, and a lot of the discussions around a project like this, an economic development project, um, are handled between staff and different agencies from the county's economic development uh, coalition, the county's economic development staff, um, the company staff. So, um, but, you know, I've had several opportunities to meet with representatives from the company throughout the um, process when they were still considering locating here, but hadn't made a decision. And one of the things I emphasized was that if they do locate here, um, you know, that the, that the county has these very ambitious renewable energy goals, uh, very strong public support for uh, ambitiously, even you know, aggressively pursuing them. And um, that I would really, you know, really wanted to urge them to look at what they could do um, to be, to do really, you know, to do, to do really strong things in this facility that are aligned with those goals. Um, you know, and they, you know, they listened, they heard that, they, they talked about some of the things they've done at some other places. Um, but honestly, I think it's only now that the decision has been made to actually locate here that realistically representatives from the company are going to now start turning their attention to really focus on these kinds of things. Because, you know, three or four months ago, they weren't even sure the project would be in Buncombe County. So, so now that that decision is made, I think the the you know the time is right and the window is open uh, to really to really engage in this. Um, I think it's a great that they have committed to lead certification of the building because that means they've already internally gotten um, you know they've internally made the decision to think about different energy efficiency components that are you know not required by the building code you know but which could be good elements to have in their facility. I don't know what consultants. I assume they'll be using some consultants to work on 
the process of looking at different options for LEED certification, which ones are the best fit for this facility, but it's good that they're already committed to having a process to look at that. So I think as, you know, as the tech committee does its work, um, there should be a process that the ideas that flow out of that can plug into um, within the organization. And I agree, I think that, um, you know, really encouraging them. I mean, what they've said is they're committed to lead silver, doesn't mean they can't go beyond that. And I think really, um, really encouraging them to go beyond that um, and to seriously explore the elements that would go into it to achieve a higher level of lead certification is probably one of the best things that we could do. So as we see from like the, you know, the county 